Hi there, Hamish McLaughlin here, and a big thanks for watching The Last Time I Cried, brought to you by AIA Vitality. Dane Beam sat down to talk to us about The Last Time He Cried. It was so compelling, we've decided to run the chat as two episodes. In 2017, Dane Beams was the captain of the Brisbane Lions. Plays on quickly. Beams wanted it. He's capable from there, Dane Beams. It's bending back. It's absolutely perfect. And was arguably in the best form of his football career. Privately, though, Dane was struggling to deal with his father's battle with cancer, which he ultimately lost in March 2018. In part one of Dane's story, he opened up about his toughest moments as he watched his father succumb to his illness and why returning to football was so difficult. Here he is, Beams steps on through. Thanks for coming in, Dan. Thanks for having me. You a cryer? Um, yeah, I uh, used to cry, yeah, a lot. Um, I haven't sort of for a month or two, but yeah, it's only been sort of that period of time where I've been able to sort of talk about my father. You and Phil were best of mates. Your parents divorced when you were five. You always wanted to be with that. Yeah, I was born in Yarrawonga, so a um, little country town there on the border of New South Wales and Victoria. And grew up there till I was five and um, mum and dad moved to Queensland to um, try and sort of salvage their marriage. and. Um, it didn't work out and Dad and I had sort of a real sort of unique bond. Um, so yeah, up, up until I was about, I think 13, it was a sort of age when I was able to live with him. Yeah, me and him just had an unbelievable relationship. So, what did he teach you? Why did you get so close? How did you get so close? I don't know, I just think as a kid, like I grew up just idolising you know, Dad, like it was just, he was my hero, like he was everything to me. Um, just had him on a pedestal and you know, he could never do anything wrong. Like it was just, I, I don't know what it was. It was just, I just felt so safe when I was around dad. And, um, you know, I've always been a little bit of a shy, um, introverted person. And I just felt like dad got me, like understood me. Like I think sometimes I've been misunderstood my whole life and um, I just felt like he was the one that really sort of understood me as a person. How do you reckon you were misunderstood and what did he see in you that others didn't? You know, I, I'm not the centre of attention, I have never have been. Um, I just sort of like to go about my business privately and people sort of misread that as me being angry or you know, arrogant when it was just, it was just who I was like. Um, and I felt like dad would never push me or you know, try and talk to me when he didn't want to be spoken to. He just, he just, got, he just understood me. Yeah, it, we, well, I mean, we spoke every single day. There wasn't a day that went by we didn't talk. So whether it was later on in his life, he discovered a text message. So once it's funny just, how fathers get it late in yeah, life, and once they're onto it. Yeah, yeah. Well, once he was under it, he didn't stop. <laughs> so when your parents separated, he stayed in Queensland. Yeah, he he stayed with us kids. Yeah. And when he got sick, that was when you wanted to move to Queensland and head to the Lions to be with Dad. Yeah, so the start of 2014 was when he was um, first diagnosed. And I still remember it like I was sitting in the back of my house and um, he called me and it was a real strange call because I could tell he was nervous. Um, and he told me and um, yeah, I remember sitting out of the back um, you know, crying about it. And just at that stage, we didn't know what was sort of going on, like what, what the process was or anything. Um, it was just all sort of up in the air and that season sort of played out. And the pre-season of that year was when he had his first first surgery. Um, I still, he never had surgery before and I still, I can remember him going in for his first surgery and like my dad was a you know, tough sort of guy, like he didn't, you know, he, he didn't really feel much pain, but I still remember his face, he was so scared, like when he was getting wheeled into that theater and it ended up being like seven hours, so that was quite stressful. Um, and then when they cut it out, it was, um, yeah, it was all good. Like nothing was, they like, pretty much went into remission. And yeah, with bowel cancer, it's just one of those things, like it can come back and yeah, it came back. And from there, it was just, yeah, it was real quick, like, um, and yeah, he, um, yeah, basically from there, it was just, yeah, just watching him die. 
So, yeah, it's pretty shit. So you were watching, as you say, him struggle and eventually die initially from afar. Must have been really tough, not being next to him. Footy was just so hard. Like, in two, like the, the year he died, um, 2018, that season, um, like the 2017 season was just, like it was just sort of like hell for me. You know, it's just like blow after blow after blow. It's just like, it just wears you down. Like, and the, the doctors are so um, blunt about it. Like, Matter of fact. Yeah, um, they just, you know, they tell you your reality, like what it, what it is and what's gonna happen. And yeah, so 2017 was, was hard because like, you know, uh, he was diagnosed um, again in October. They gave him three years in October to a follow-up appointment in November, and it went to um, it went to one year, um, and then he had a follow-up appointment again in December, and it went to six months. <laughs> yeah, and then in January he was uh, gave, given three months, and then he died in February, February 28th. So over the space of like four months, it went from three years to to dead. So it was just like so quick and I'd never seen anything like it. Like it was, I, I, I knew about cancer, but I didn't, I just didn't know the severity and how bad it can get. In the end, he was, you know, we had a hospital bed set up in my, in my house. Um, yeah, upstairs, he, he lived in one of the spare bedrooms upstairs for a while until he then couldn't get up the stairs. Yeah, and then, yeah, just the, yeah, then having having him in the in the hospital bed um, downstairs and like doing things like like cleaning his like like his bum and like watching him. <laughs> I just stuff you you should be doing with your parents. So from there, it was once he was downstairs, he was only there for a little bit, and it was just too much for us to to handle on our own. And yeah, he went into hospital for the last five nights, and yeah, that's where he died. Were you with him when he passed? Yeah. Yeah, I remember I was there till seven um, and I went home and yeah, um, they called, the hospital called and they sort of know that they've been around, they know it. If I mean, they're in that palliative care ward and they know the stages. So they rang us and just said, um, you better come back. Um, and yeah, we had, he had like all of his kids and his brother and his sister. And yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was horrible. Like, like I saw the image in my head and like, cause he, he sort of, like I was sort of on the left, like the left hand side and um, his right hand side and he sort of rolled it. Like he just like looked at me and like he's like the heart. Like his eyes were like rolling in the back of his head. He just took his last breath. My brother and I didn't want, didn't want to leave him and you yeah, know with him all the way down until they put him into the morgue. How do you remember him? Oh, he was just just a gen like he's just a, he was a gen gentle man, like loved everyone, like you know, he had so much more living to do, like he was only fifty six. And my wife was you know, pregnant with our second kid when he died and our Carter was only born a couple of months after him dying and I remember um yeah, tell, uh, telling him because I wanted to call him Philip. When you had your best moment together, where was it? <laughs> At the pub. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Did you? Yeah. The, yeah. Per- the perfect father-son relationship. Yeah. Footy. Dad enjoyed a beer and uh, that's where footy sort of became really hard for me because I just, everything about footy was my dad, you know, he, when I was in Brisbane, he'd come to you know, my house before every home game and he'd drive into the game with me. He'd just talk about the game. I was pretty quiet, like I'd get quite nervous, so I wouldn't say a whole lot. But yeah, then after the game, he'd be pretty full at the end of the game. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he'd come back and pretty much meet me at the same spot I left him. And we'd just drive home and um, sometimes he'd fall asleep in the car. Other times we'd talk about the game, but depending if we won or lost. But He was a very good footballer. I wasn't old enough to remember him playing footy, but everyone tells me how good he was. And, um, you know, he won seven BNFs at my Whaler Footy Club and yeah, the, the best and fairest is named after Dad, so. It sounds like there's one thing you need to do in footy. Yeah, I'd love to go and play um, back back at Mull, where Dad played, just purely just to sort of pull on the jump. I'd love to play, you know, where he won seven BNFs and the, the medal's named after him. and. Yeah, it's something that I want to do eventually, but at the moment I'm not thinking about football, so um, it will be something that I do, though. Make sure you remember your dad as a healthy Philip you had to be with. It's been hard to sort of be able to remember him like that. Um, I feel like I'm coming out of that now and I could actually sort of you know, smile about him and um, think about all the good things. Because um, there's so many, like, there's so many good memories with dad, like, yeah, he was just yeah, an amazing person. And, I'll make sure that you know my kids remember him that way as well. And the impact that he had on us will yeah, definitely never be forgotten. The year he died, it was at the start of the season, so the season launch, they introduced you know, groups of five players up onto the stage and each of them would have a song like when they were walking up onto the stage and my group came on and it was um, it was Dad's funeral song. And like out of all the songs in the world they could have picked, like it was Dad's funeral song. And like, it was just like little strange things like that. It was like, oh, yeah, he's, he's still there. Next week in part two, Dane describes what happened in the aftermath, the mental health battles, addiction, and the cry for help earlier this year that finally set him on the right path.